And welcome everybody to another episode of Smart Money Circle. I'm your host, Adam Sarhan. With me today is CC Lagador, who's co-founder of Options AI, which is a new brokerage firm that makes option spreads enjoyable and straightforward with an easy to use visual, which I love visual, platform. CC, welcome to the Smart Money Circle and thank you for coming on the show. Great to meet you. So likewise, so CC, can you tell us a little about your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure. So I was a, an options market maker uh, okay. right out of college. And, and so, you know, I was in New York on the floor of the American Stock Exchange way back when, before everything was completely computerized. And, you know, I did that for years. And then at some point I left that and I was doing a lot of options and trading education. Mm -hmm. I was working with some, you know, some uh, people that are on CNBC and things like that and started seeing the option space, particularly in the trading space, through the eye of the retail investor a little bit more. When you're on the options market making side, you know, you're essentially, it's, it's all sort of faceless. Like you can see if something's from Goldman Sachs, you can see if something's retail, you don't really get a sense of like the intention behind right. all of that order flow. <laughs> and then, you know, working with a little bit, you know, as an educator and working with a retail audience and seeing how people were using options and seeing that there was like a, you know, sort of a big void and a big difference between the way institutions use options and the way, you know, retail investors, everyday investors use options. Seeing that difference um, was sort of the inspiration behind Options AI, which was, you know, options trading platforms and brokerages haven't really changed in 40 years. I mean, there's right. more bells and whistles and all, but it's still this focus of, you know, uh, platforms that don't really look that different than, you know, back when I was on like the trading floor, mm -hmm. you know, walls of numbers, it's options chains, it's Greeks, it's all of this sort of, um, you know, like esoteric knowledge that's really intimidating for the retail audience. And unfortunately, what comes from that is that, you know, p retail investors reach for the things in options that they can understand really quickly. And that right. tends to be things like buying calls or buying puts and things like that. And so what that ends up looking like from an order flow perspective is retail order flow is generally looks like lottery tickets, right? right. It's yeah. people being like, you know, scanning an options chain saying, I can afford a $1 call. What if this stock went up? Right. right. I'd be right. Two dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And whereas institutional option order flow is much more, um, you know, sort of well thought out, you know, for lack of a better term, it's, you know, it's sort of using options as a plan. It's using options around uh, portfolios, uh, existing positions. It's positioning for a move in a stock that they like or hate, you know, in the case of a hedge fund in a way where it's like, you know, this, we, we want to position for this stock going 15% higher over the next few months. Mm -hmm. We don't want to waste money thinking that it can go up 50%, right? Because that, the chances of that happening are unlikely. So that, so what and that ends up looking like is the way <clears throat> institutional order flow looks, it's multi-leg options trades. It's, you know, it's creating zones of profitability and defined risk losses in the options chain, if you can imagine that. And yeah, so, seriously. <laughs> yeah. It's and funny so, to you and I, but to some people, it's, it's, a, it's a real blind spot. They don't look at that side of the equation. Right. And yeah. so when we went, sat down to build options AI, we were like, all right, well, let's sort of tear up the entire, you know, game plan up until that point. We purposely did not look at a lot of other products and we started thinking, you know, like, how do we, how do at us, like ourselves as experts, see the options market? And we see it much differently than a wall of numbers, or at least most of us. And it's more, you know, we decided that this, this should be highly visual. You know, most investors and most traders are looking at stock charts. Right. And they're saying, I would love to buy the stock down here. Or if the stock went up here, I'd probably sell, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or here I'm confused and I'm not quite sure what I would want to do, right? Right. And the options market provides all of that, those sorts of opportunities to buy low, sell high, create income from a stock going sideways. And all of those things, you can really picture it. You start to think of the options chain out into the future as sort of these levels of, you know, where I could, you know, be a seller, a buyer, or 
you know, ad leverage, you know, all of those sorts of things. And so what we did is we based everything around a visualization of the options market. So at Options AI, you see the historical chart and then you see a visualization of the future. And that future is basically the options chain drawn out with expectations from the options market. And yeah, that's based on the, uh, sorry, the, those expectations are based on the Greeks or how they, how do you base those expectations? Yeah, so it's basically, it is. And but even thinking, you know, how you got to the Greeks is basically just buyers and sellers, right? Okay. So the same way that the historical stock prices were buyers meeting sellers and, you know, finding consensus and then, you know, one side of the that <laughs> trade went wrong. Right. The options market is doing the same thing. And the, the beauty of the options market is it's incredibly efficient. Right. And it, it includes every person from the Robin Hood trader with $500 in their account all the way up to Goldman Sachs, right? right? And it's all of those people's expectations out into the future. And so where you get into like sort of the Greeks and things is the options market creates something that, you know, options traders call the expected move. Right. And the expected move, the easiest way to think of that and to visualize that is it is basically like the point spread on a on a football game right mm -hmm. so if a stock is $100 and they're about to report earnings then the options market is doing a price of where all of those expectations in the future think that stock could move higher or lower mm -hmm. and that comes out as the expected move and so let's say a $100 stock the options market is expecting a move of $8 on earnings well, that means that we can draw that out into the future for that week of earnings and say, you know, the options market is pricing a move anywhere from $92 to $108. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that's going to happen. Right. That means that's where everybody has put their options. You that's know, a consensus. That's a consensus. consensus yeah. Right. Yeah. So to go to do any sort of, you know, we would make the argument before you do any investment or any trade or particularly any options trade. How could you not like first look at that information, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're like, oh, I'm really bearish, this company's done, they're, you know, they're going to miss. It's like, all right, well, is $92 right? Because if you think it's going to be much worse than that, then that's opportunity in the options market, right? right. right. And so very much like that sort of sport, sports betting analogy is you need to know what the options market's pricing before you even like weighed in. And if you were right. going to buy that stock, and they've got an earnings coming up or, you know, something like that. It's like, well, my risk, the options market is pricing my risk basically down 8% or whatever. Right. And that I should know what that means you know, monetarily to my position if that happens. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, and then what we do on options AI is you can then do those options trades, do those, you know, adding income at, you know, using them for leverage, adding protection, and you can see that on the chart and then instantly see, you know, as you've dragged these things around on the chart, which is essentially your options positions, you know, what is my risk? What is my reward? What is the probability of Oh, this? that's cool. It'll adjust accordingly yes. as you drag it? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically taking all of that intimidation factor from the options chain and making it, you know, options are basically can be intimidating because you get into all of this um you know sort of nuance right but that nuance is like 10 5 to 10 percent of options trading the other like 90 percent is really straightforward math it is yeah. you know is this stock going to be above or below this break even you know in two weeks or two months or a year yeah and that's where everybody should start is if they understand those sorts of break evens and which side of that break even am i on they can get to the nuance later, but that's the core of like an options position. And yeah, just that's what we're to show on the chart, basically. Just to explain to the audience what TC is saying here is that options at, by expiration, they're binary, you either win or you lose. So if you buy a call option, let's say at 108 and, and expires in two weeks, that two weeks from now, when that time comes, if it's above 108 and you own the call, you win. If it's below there, you lose more or less, minus a premium, all that kind of stuff. So having the ability to understand that in mind takes 80 to 90%, you said, of the equation, like the confusion out of it? 
Yeah. And, and I, I, I say this to people and they look at me like I'm crazy sometimes. I'm like, it, it is not, you know, people are like, oh, you were an options market maker. You must be some like math whiz. And I was like, I'm not really. It is not, it's, it's not, not a ton of variables, the core of options. You know, there are, there are some little like nuanced variables that I think that, you know, only a professional options trader could like understand. And then you're getting into like second level Greeks and things like that. But yeah. for that's only that's mostly just important for somebody that's professional options market maker jobs like that on Wall Street, where you have a million positions for somebody that's looking to go long Apple. Yeah. They should be concerning themselves with the basics and right. or else they're going to trip themselves up and they're going to make, you know, bad decisions because they're going to be missing the forest for the trees. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like trying to learn division before you learn addition and subtraction. It's just exactly. it's not right. Yeah. yeah okay. I see that in a lot of education, you know, they start with like the Greeks and things and I'm like, you just wait on that stuff, you know, like figure out basic <laughs> probability. I love that. So let's talk. I'm, I'm interested in several things you've got going on CC first. Talk to me about the money maker oh, options, the market maker, not money maker, but the market, maybe it's this Freudian slip there, the market making activities. And when you saw it on the exchange, what was that like from being there and then now being removed from it? Do you feel that there's an edge to being there or is it, they're not an edge? And how does that work a little bit? Can you explain what that yeah. looked like and so on and so forth? So just to sort of explain that market making job in general. So if somebody goes to like if most of your audience, you know, everybody's probably bought stock and sold stock and all. When you go to buy shares of Apple or Spy or something like that, you probably are being, um, at the same time you were buying Apple shares, someone else is selling Apple shares somewhere out there, right? right? And you're being matched up, right? Um, with options, there are thousands of strikes and, you know, dozens of expirations. So you can imagine the chances of you putting in a call buy in Apple, you know, $20 away, two months out and meeting somebody doing that exact same behavior, selling that at the same time, it's close to zero. Right. So what market makers and options do is they're generally on the other side of every single one of your trades. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, and, you know, there's, um, there's, you know, cases like if you're trading like SPY and QQQ, you know, there's there's a lot more at the money that week, right? You well, might, they're super, super liquid. That's what you mean, right? Opposed yeah. to some that aren't liquid. Okay, got yeah. it. You might be getting yeah. paid or you're, or you're buying and somebody's already got an order resting there, right? Yeah. So, but other than that, in general, most of like 80, let's say I'm making up a number, but let's say 80%, 90% of the, you're trading with a market maker. Mm -hmm. And so what a market maker is doing is providing the liquidity in the options market that wouldn't be there otherwise. And the way that job works is you're essentially taking all of that order flow, buying, selling, and you're reacting in real time to it because you don't want to be um, take on a massive position based upon getting caught sleeping and everybody suddenly buys a bunch of options from you <laughs> in some biotech company that you didn't even know was about to have FDA approval on something, right? Right. Because you're generally not even following the news and all of these stuff. Yeah, yeah it's too much, yeah, too much going on. Too yeah. much, right. Yeah. So, and yeah, you see some big order from Goldman Sachs and some biotech stock, you know, something's up, right? Right. So, the but, so that options market market maker all day long as as a career is basically trying to stay as neutral as possible. So you'll hear like delta neutral options trading because yeah. they don't want to be taking big market risks overnight. They're also trying to stay somewhat neutral as to their net sells and buys of options, which is called gamma and vega and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're basically making their money with either in two different ways the the more sophisticated and fancier way of explaining the job would be that they're buying low volatility and selling high volatility okay. and what they're doing that is over time as volatility goes low they'll be a little bit longer and as it goes higher they'll be a little bit uh shorter, shorter right? because it's mean reverting mm -hmm. but really what they're doing is all of those trades intraday on all of those different strikes, they're getting tiny different um, prices based upon their fair value of those options. So if somebody sells you a 100 call at you know, $1, 
and you have a fair value price of a dollar five, you're unlikely to then just be able to go flip that option, but some other option strike, somebody might be paying you 50 cents and you have a fair value of 45 cents. So that options market maker has just it created 10 cents of edge. Now that 10 cents of edge isn't guaranteed because then you've got to, this whole thing has to play out over that time. Ass, right. But it's like, that's how they're making money day to day. Got it. And so it's the sophistication of being a trader gets talked up a lot, but really what they're doing is all that intraday, you know, mm -hmm. sorts of things like we're they're just creating edge every day and then managing their positions to hope, hopefully capture as much of that edge by expiration as possible. So you said there's two ways they make money. The first is to buy a vol when it's low and sell vol when it's high. The second, time, right? yeah. And the second was, was what was scalp was the uh, difference between it's basically scalping edge. Scalping right? the edge. So it's not, whereas a, a, like somebody making markets in a stock, they can buy mm -hmm. the stock for $100 you know, dollars and then they can sell it at $100 and five cents. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's like guaranteed money. Yeah. The options market maker doesn't have that opportunity that often. Right. So they bought something that they valued at one dollar, and then sold something that they valued at one a dollar five or you know whatever, and they've created five cents in edge, which Got they it. hope to capture by not messing up their positions in the next three weeks or something. I love that. So basically, what you, with the options, you're not really what you can, but most of the time you're trying to buy the midpoint or somewhere in between where it's going. So it's a lot of flexibility with respect to where you get executed. Whereas a yeah. stock, you kind of get filled. There's a bid and ask, and it's really straightforward. But with options, it's more of a nuance. So that nuance is where the market maker comes in and that's their edge because they can buy here, sell there, buy here, sell there, or sell, buy, sell, whatever they want to do. Is that yes. correct? Without getting, I feel like I've got a little too far into the weeds there, but like there's a great lesson in what I just said. I was, yeah. So the <laughs> options markets are wider, right? Than equity markets, right? That's where there's, it is. Less, there's less liquidity. There's less retail traders on each side of it. Yeah. So you may see a, let's say you saw a call and it was $1 at $1.30, right? Yeah. So the midpoint is, you know, $1.15. Mm -hmm. That $1 and $1.30 is what those market makers are showing, but you're going into a competitive options market where if a bunch of people have priced that in their models, uh, some people might have priced that, that they're willing to pay $1.15 for that or $1.10. And so it's a really good lesson for people that are going to, when they get to the point of actually executing an options trade, <clears throat> they should price discover in between those bid, bids and asks because there are computers and algorithms at all of these market making firms uh -huh. that all you need is, you know, you might get executed really close to the midpoint of an options thing. Yeah. Sometimes that you, sometimes you won't, and you really Correct. have to keep going down towards the bid or up towards the offer. But yeah. you've got to, you know, and we do that on Options AI. We we try to provide a lot of these like sort of nudges through the platform, and that is one of them. Is our ticket encourages a cancel and replace, cancel and replace until you find that you know that price, that liquidity. And what we we don't even offer a market buy or sell button on our ticket because we came from that side of the business. You know that, yeah. And we right. know there's yeah. liquidity within that bid and ask, you know, in general. And sometimes th there isn't, but you know, it depends what you're trading, you know? So I love this. So basically you were able, what you're able to do now with options AI is kind of where I was going with that. You Thank you for diving in deep there. And, and yeah. it was very helpful for us to understand the market maker's role. It's really critical, but with options, the when you come to get executed, there's a wider spread and you can, hit the bid, hit the ask, or you can go somewhere in the midpoint. So with yeah. options AI, you have that tool built in to help the individual investor find a better price than just right. hitting the market order and buying outright. Exactly. Is like we do not want people to submit, and it's particularly because we specialize in multi-leg option spreads okay. where all of those things I just talked about compound, right? Yeah. So when you're doing, a, you know, selling a call and buying a call simultaneously, then you've just taken two spreads and increased, you know, you've doubled the size of the entire spread for your order. So in that case, you absolutely want to be working that order. You know, like you start at the, we, you know, we encourage on the ticket, it yeah. starts at the midpoint and it's a instantaneous, pretty much instantaneous cancel and replace. So you can just sort of lock it down until you find that liquidity. I love it. Well, thank you. That's a that's beautiful. Fantastic. Right. Okay. Next question, CC, for you. 
Um, let's dive a little bit deeper into Options AI. Can you tell us about the business and the value people get from using it and how it differs, the competitive advantages? You know, speak to that a little bit, please. Yeah, so, you know, we've positioned ourselves, you know, going back to like what I was saying earlier, that most retail options trading is basically being used as lottery tickets. And okay. we've actually seen statistics. We were in an article a couple of months ago on CNBC where you know, they mentioned Robinhood's order flow. And I don't, I don't mean to pick on Robinhood or anything, but it's the most retail of retail. You know, Great, right? it's poster child, yeah. Right, exactly. Right. And so 99% of their order flow is single leg options. And so when I see that, somebody that's an insider, you know, sees that statistic, it basically means that most people are doing YOLO call buying, right? Mm -hmm. And a probably very low, will, you know, guaranteed, a very low probability of profit, which means they're looking at a $100 stock and they're saying, wouldn't this be amazing if it went to 125, right? Right. So institutional order flow looks almost exactly opposite. And it looks wow. like, you know, most, uh, one of my co-founders, he came from the institutional options brokerage side of the business. And he's like, I never see any institution do a single leg options order. And if they do, <laughs> If, if they do, it's probably guaranteed against some big, you know, stock position. Right. And even then they still use spreads, right? Um, and so anyway, like you never see that, you know, they're mirror opposites, right? And so Options AI, it's, it's basically, you know, in a few clicks, I can say, you know, I'm bullish, bearish, neutral, where I can create levels on the chart. And Options AI is immediately putting a few options trades, uh, you know, in front of you. Now, some of them are calls and puts, you know, occasionally you do just want to do that. But for the most part, you know, people are seeing, oh, you know, I could do a call spread in this case, in this stock that I like. And, or I could even sell a credit put spread, meaning I'm like okay. taking the other side of like, you know, I'm basically just positioning that the stock does not go lower. Right. 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 And with, with those kinds of trades, you see that probability of profit. Like, for instance, that credit put spread might have a 65% probability of profit, which makes perfect sense, right? Like, the probability of a stock going down $8 yeah. is better than 50%, right? If you're buying something for the stock to go higher, you're going to be less than 50%. You need the stock to move $8, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so those sorts of things. And what ends up happening is when you get those trades in front of that audience, they, it immediately clicks. And they're like, oh man, you know, like now that I see like there were four different ways to express this view, yeah. I'm going to like, you know, I, I really liked this other one and I wouldn't have, I, I would have needed the intent of to do that trade on another platform. I need, I would have needed to go to my E-Trade platform or whatever and said, I want to do a credit put spread yeah. and figure out which credit put spread I wanted to do. Yeah. With options AI, you just said, I think, you know, I'm bullish. Right. And it's like here's one of the <laughs> options is a credit put spread. And so what ends up happening is about 80 to 85% of our order flow is multi-leg options. Okay. And so that means that we are the mirror opposite of Robinhood. And right. our order flow looks a lot more like institutional order flow. And it's kind of hilarious because when you're on the market making side of things, that has a name and it's called toxic, right? Toxic. Okay. Toxic order flow. Because you're going to lose most likely, right? The market, makers, market makers are lose, right? Because they, yeah. it's, they think it's smart money, right? Yeah, right. And what's funny is that if somebody's doing those sorts of trades from a retail brokerage, the market makers, it's very difficult for them to tell the difference, which is right. Kind of hilarious. Right. So, you know, a lot of a lot of our order flow, I mean, it might it might be a lot smaller, but it's the same strategies that institutional, you know, uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, big money management companies, you know, things like that. It's their type of order flow. It looks like it, which is sort of funny. So we've always thought about using that in branding. It's like be toxic order flow. Right. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's awesome. So basically yeah. what you're doing with options AI is you're helping the retail investor think and execute orders like the institutional investor, almost right. that dumb money, smart money kind of parallel. It's like helping people come into the smart money circle, part of the pun there, and yeah. creating smarter orders and accomplishing the same goal, but just doing it in a more efficient and smarter way. Is that correct? 
Exactly. And so, you know, we can't obviously, you know, trading and investing is hard, right? And you take losses and you're wrong and things right. like that. But what we want to do is like set people up for the highest probability of success. And at the same time, we only offer, you know, this is some, another decision that we made is we don't think retail traders should be doing things with unlimited risk. And so on Options AI, everything is defined risk, right? So you, there are no abilities to get into a trade and not understand your risk. And it. it's all defined. It's like this trade, I understand this. I have a 60% probability of profit. I'm risking $400. I'm sorry, I'm risking $600 to make $400 on something that is slightly more than 50% you know, chance of happening, right? Mm -hmm. And I get that. Yeah. And what that does, you know, to your, you know, your area of expertise with like psychology and all is yeah. that we want, you know, he, all of us as humans are really bad at decision making, especially under pressure, right? And it's a huge thing. I've always said, it's funny with the title of your book, I've always said, if like I started a hedge fund, I would hire like psychology majors, not finance majors. Right. And so the like, you know, that, that, the, those ways to use options, like to add income to a portfolio, to hedge a portfolio, like in times like this, mm -hmm. so that you can sleep at night, not yeah. only sleep at night and make better decisions, but when the market's down 30%, you've yeah. set yourself up so that you're a buyer down 30%, not a panic seller, right? Right. And those, and those are the ways that like options should be used because that's exactly the way that like hedge funds are using options, right? They're not setting themselves up for unlimited losses because you can't be that guy that blew up the hedge fund, right? So retail, the retail, you know, investing everyday investor should be thinking about options the same way. It's like, how do I, you know, how do I, if you're an active investor, your goal is to beat the market, right? Or else you wouldn't be doing it, or it's just a hobby and it's fun, right? <laughs> but if you didn't care about these things, you would just be invested in a index fund, right? No, you want to win. But yeah, you play the game to win. Yeah, you're playing the game to win, right? And so why not play it exactly like the professionals are doing, which is, you know, using options, not as like, oh, wouldn't it be great if this happened? It's like, it's probably not going to happen. So let me do it this way, right? That's, that's and, yeah. Yeah. You know, Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, oh, it, yeah. I was going to say, it sound, I mean, we started around, the, I started in the 90s, and it sounded like you wrote my book, because that's literally <laughs> my outline here in the book. And actually, CC, I'll take it a step further, since we have this psychology thing in common. I think this is the first finance book that I know of, at least, that has cartoons in it. So oh, I'll digress for a second. I've got a dumb money beast, which is the Tasmanian devil, almost right. like an emotional creature that runs around. And then the smart money superhero. And the whole right. idea is to help to bring out the smart money superhero so you can step back and make the rational, not emotional decisions with your money. And one, one, uh, without a spoiler alert for the book, but one of my most important rules is to respect risk, right? So yes. always defense first. Before you enter, know where you're going to exit, how much you're going to risk if you're wrong, and yada, yada, yada. But I love what you're saying here. This is really powerful. So to be able to do that with options and yes. have a platform that's visually friendly is, I mean, that's genius in my mind's eye because I don't think that's ever been done before. Am I, am I, are you, is that correct? Exactly. And, and it, it comes from our experiences and it's, you know, being at a professional like derivatives trading firm, mm -hmm. the best traders in the firm were the guys whose emotions were like that, right? Yeah. Like a straight line across and they never got too high and they never got too low. They were the guys, that guys and gals that played my wife. That's where I met my wife. Mm -hmm. Um Nice. They were the, you know, they were the types of people, you know, looking for singles and doubles every single day, singles and doubles yeah. every single day. Right. And you could tell that person that walks into, you know, and I'm sure this happens at every hedge fund and every big, you know, trading desk at a big bank and everything. You could tell the people that look like they're going to blow up the firm, right? Yeah. yeah. And they're, <laughs> they're the types that think they have it figured out see patterns where there are no patterns right. and don't trust, you know, you, you, that humility, right? Yeah. It's a really important uh, thing in investing and trading, right? Because yeah. everyone, no matter how good you are at this, you've had a, you, you've had a recent horrible experience. Like I'm sure Warren Buffett has 100%. had a recent horrible experience in the last three months, right? Yeah. Some investment of this is probably tanked. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, humility is, 
what you need to be successful over time. And so what we would say with like options trading is, you know, unfortunately, most people's entry into the options market is it's being sold to them as a get rich quick scheme. And it's, it's, it shouldn't be that way. It should be an overtime strategy of, you know, there's an options market that could potentially add income to my portfolio. There's an options market that could help me sleep at night on my portfolio. There's an options market where if I'm really geeked up on some stock that's down, you know, like for instance, take like a Shopify or something right now, yeah. it's down like 85%. Yeah. And it's like, well, do I want to put a bunch of my money in Shopify or do I want to like take a shot in Shopify? So if I want to take a shot in Shopify, mm -hmm. then there's like, all right, I can do some defined risk options trade where I get like this, you know, I get a chance. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I don't like, you know, it doesn't ruin my year. Right. right. And so those types, types of things are the way that people should be seeing the options market. I love it. So earlier today, actually, I was watching TV in the morning, which I don't normally do, but Michael Novogratz was on. He was talking about crypto and he had a big tattoo of Luna and Luna was right. one of the cryptos that went to zero or something like that. it imploded or whatever. Right. So he the, the lady on TV asked him, what about the tattoo? You regret getting it. He's like, no, he fired back instantly saying it's a good reminder that you're not oh, always right. Yes. That you're going to have losses. You're going to be wrong. So on and so forth. And that speaks to your point right there, right? Where yeah. not, everybody, he's a multi, he's a self-made billionaire, that guy. And right. took, he just took it on the chin. So yeah. it's so powerful if you respect risk and you do that right over time, how you can compound your wins. I love well, he's that. Gonna so, have, yeah, he's going to have, all he has to do is look down on his arm. That's it. It's right there. It's like this yeah. huge tattoo. It's huge. Right. That's all right. I, yeah, I love that. So, okay, that's how you handle risk. Let's talk about uh, the business, some timeless lessons you've learned along the way. CC that you'd like to share with the audience could be trading lessons, life lessons, relationship, whatever you want. Yeah. So the, what we were just talking about is interesting because it, you can sort of take it one step further, which is zooming out. Right. Yeah. And this is one of those like trading lessons um, that I think everyone who's like, you sort of actively done it either professionally or, you know, at home, um, you know, like those times when you're like zooming in so close, like on the chart, like from the last half an hour, trying to see patterns. <laughs> you're going to love this. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's like, oh my gosh, like you're flipping a coin, right? Yeah. And like trying to like predict the market intraday and trying to predict a stock and all that sort of thing. And so then when you realize, when you look back at your history, when you zoomed out and saw the big picture, you made such, you know, much more clear decisions. They, did, they didn't have to be as precise, right? Like, you know, when you were zoomed in on a stock chart, like you've got to get the next 20 minutes right, right? Yeah, 100%. But when you zoom out, you're like, all right, well, the markets, you know, for instance, the market right now, what was it down 30 some percent last week or two weeks ago or something like that? I mean, traditionally, if I told you, like if I woke you up from a coma after a year and I was like, the market's down 30 some percent, would you be bearish or bullish, right? You'd want to you'd buy it bullish. cheaper, understood, yeah. yeah. You'd yeah. rather, right? right? I mean, not that I'm not saying that this is the bottom and it could be worse or whatever, but it's certainly 30% cheaper than it was. The fundamental, yeah, value investors would be bullish, the technicians would be bearish, but I, I get your point. You're like, hey, yeah. it takes you- And so when you're zooming out. out, you're all of a sudden, all right, well, now the big picture is I can't predict what's gonna happen over the next two weeks, but I do know that my longer term things are now cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm thinking about longer term investments. And my shorter term strategy is focused on the current volatility, right? Right. And so, you know, like I should be thinking about like, how do I not get run over in this market short term? And how do I have the bullets to like take advantage of, a, you know, something like this long term, right? And so that sort of zooming out all of a sudden informs that zoom in, right? So by right. zooming out first, you, you've, you know, focused on the, um, like what to do that day, really. Yes. Um, so I think that's like a great lesson. That's something you learn is you, like you trade is like you realize you're zoomed in too, too, too often, right? Um, Couldn't agree and that's with like, you. Yeah, I don't know. There's like a metaphor for life there, I guess. There is. So again, I'm going to, I can't believe the over the parallels here. So on page 82 of my book, I talk about it. I have a thing, you know, you're familiar with arbitrage, right? Yeah. Concept of arbitrage. So for those, for the audience, it's just a discrepancy in price. And it, let's say gold is really high and gold stocks are down. You can sell one by the other and then eventually it, it, it mean reverts and that's that. So I have uh, that zooming out. I call it time arbitrage. I right. see most people trading 
they lose because they're looking at the forget the they see the they miss the forest they forget the trees they're looking at the leaves on the trees because they're looking mm-hmm. at the minute chart or the half hour chart even the daily charts most days just don't matter so i right. call it time arbitrage where the long term investors win because they're able to step back and they don't care about the 20 minute chart or the, the one minute chart or that kind of stuff and they're they're aligning themselves with the longer term uptrend right. or, you know that kind of stuff so yep. that's a really really powerful concept I love and there's, that. by the way, in, in options, there's very specific uh, ways that this plays out. And uh, what I was sort of describing, like longer term positioning and short term positioning, this is where options market makers, for instance, like right now, volatility is high, right? Right. They want to be net short volatility across their entire portfolio because eventually, who knows when, the VIX is going to go from 30 back to 15, right? right. At some point. In yeah. 19, it's like it's historical mean or something like that. But yeah. you've got to survive for however long it takes for it to do that, right? And so as right. an options, so as an <laughs> option derivatives trader, or you know, you're not betting everything on volatility going back to 19 immediately because you were going to get run over in the meantime. Right. right. So in and so there's lessons from that as to like what to be doing as an investor and all in times like this, which is being really, really careful and protecting yourself short term and trying to start to think about the long term, right? Got it. Yeah. So I, I love that. Let's talk about timeless mistakes. What are some timeless mistakes you've seen people make or you've made and, you know, how do you avoid them? Ooh-wee. Um you can get more than one. Say, well, I think I mentioned the phrase earlier, like seeing patterns where there are no patterns, right? Like yeah. this is one of those like cognitive biases that I'm sure in your book. Yep, it's and in the book. I, yeah. love, I love those lists with cognitive biases because it is exact when you are like a trader, a professional trader, and every investor should have this as well, is you see that you have to recognize the cognitive biases in yourself. And that goes back to what I was saying, like the best traders you saw and that sort of even temperament. What that even temperament was hiding was a lot of that like self-reflection and meta-analysis. And it's like staring at the Luna tattoo yeah. every day, right? It's, right? it's sort of like, all right, why am I making mistakes? Like, what am I doing right now, right? right? I feel like the mistakes you see people make is is feeling like they've figured it out, right? Oh, and, oh, the other side of it. Okay, got it. The yeah. other side of it is the mistake yeah. is like seeing those patterns and, and you know, we used to, you know, options market making and trading, it tends to be a young person's profession. And mm-hmm. there's a reason for that is as you get older, my age, <laughs> you start to like some of those things creep in, right? You, you, you get set in your ways a little bit. You're, you're less um, sort of open to the randomness of it all, right? And when you're young, it's like, oh, this is just straight math and probability. As you get older, you're like, oh, you know, I, I, I think I've got this kind of figured out and all. And then you don't, right? right? And so that humility and, you know, stepping back and seeing the, the randomness of it all yeah. And trying to like think of the big picture is very important and, and thinking you, you have it figured out. Again, like going back to like a Warren Buffett, I'm sure he seems like a really, he seems very humble on those fronts, right? Like he's, right. he's probably, he's not the type of person going out saying like, I, I have this all figured out. And I, you know, think, look at all these great investments and everything like that. He's like, he probably uses words like we got really, you know, we happened to get great timing on this investment and we got really lucky in this investment. So I, I trust people that use the word lucky, right? Um, a lot more than like, I crushed it because I'm so smart. Yeah, you're so right. I, I've interviewed countless people on the show and I'm, I'm fascinated with the smart money. And, you know, you don't get a six pack by accident. You don't become a billionaire by accident. You don't join the smart money circle by accident, right? There's certain things you do and then you'll get the six pack or whatever that you win, right? So right. one of the golden threads or the, the um, think of a tree trunk, you've got different branches. People do different things. Your options, another guy might be stock, another guy might be fundamentals, technicals. And it all comes back to the trunk of the tree, which is some version of humility and or n- knowing I don't know, which is what right. I say. That means I have one job, which is to learn and I'm constantly doing this. It's a labor of love. I love it. Yep. And once you cross that line of saying, oh, I know and I'm great. And then, you know, all that hubris and yada, yada, yada kicks in, game over. I mean, that's yeah. one of my favorite movies. I'll digress for a second, but yep. bear with me here because the link back to the options trading is uh, from a line from Nicolas Cage in the movie Lord of War. And right. he was an arms dealer, interestingly enough, from Ukraine. And um, 
in the movie, there's a great scene. He builds himself up and blah, blah, blah. At the very top before the downfall, he says, I suffered the curse of invincibility. Right. That was so unbelievably powerful. When the traders are, you know, because I deal with a lot of traders and investors, once you start pulling out the calculator and typing in how much money I'm going to make from that trade, almost always it goes right against you at that moment or shortly thereafter. Exactly. So, exactly. I love what you're saying then, here about the humility. And then there's a, the flip side of the coin is, you know, you want to be doing that constant meta-analysis. You want to be questioning, you know, everything. There's a way to go too far on that too, right? Yes. So you can have like, you can be paralyzed by meta-analysis to the point where you can no longer commit to something like an investment or, or something like that. And I've seen this with people that they're, they're unable to hang on to winners. Yes. Or they, they're doing something that is an initial loss or something like that. And, it, you know, going back to the zooming out, yeah. And they're, they're sort of paralyzed by all of that doubt and those things. So you have to be humble, but confident, I guess is yeah. like the best way to put it is like, it's like, you've done your research. You really like this stock or you really like this option strategy. And it's been, you know, it's worked for you great in the past, like making decisions like that, you know, don't start necessarily like overanalyzing that part. Correct. Right. Yeah. And because you can, you know, I've seen people that like, yeah, like they make investments and then like a month later, I'm like, how's that thing going? And they're like, oh man, I got out of that thing in like a week. And you're yeah, like, why? Not even. <laughs> you months. loved it. You loved it. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. It's all you so right. really shut up about it. And now you get like got out of it in a week. That's crazy. No, so, I absolutely love that. So yeah. okay, that's that's really, really good. So next question for you, CC. What makes a great leader? And I'm going to follow it up with what makes a great trader or investor. So there's two questions there, I guess maybe three. Yeah. So leaders interesting because now being in, you know, like sort of the tech startup world, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of interesting. I'm, this is, it comes at the same time in my life where I have young, uh, children, not so young, like they're 10 and 12, uh, and coaching them in sports is really interesting because I would say one of the lessons with like leadership with a company and a small company um, in particular, I guess at a big company it would be on, on every level is like hire smart people mm -hmm. and get out of their way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I see this a lot in, you know, coaching. I see so much like over coaching. Um, I was, a uh, I played lacrosse in college and I coach, you know, like my son's lacrosse team. And I see it, you know, sometimes from the other sidelines and things where it's like, the, the coaches are literally shouting at the kids like every step of the way what to do yeah. and like by the time a kid on a field has processed what just came in audibly from a sideline like the moment has passed right and so what you want to do as a leader or a coach or whatever is to get them to the point where you've given them that decision making ability before they've gotten onto the field so what right. you should be working on when you're leading a company and everything like that is I want to hire, I want to find smart people mm -hmm. and I want them to, I want to trust their decision-making. So I want to sort of give them how decisions are made in this company or, you know, this group, this organization, whatever it is. And then I want them to, when they come to me, I, the, the best people that, you know, I work with, they come to me with a question that needs solving and they already have a solution that they want to pitch me. Right. Oh, nice. And yeah. I, I love it because That's I'm great. like, it's basically me giving them the okay 90% yeah. of the time to proceed in the way that they're already thinking, rather than coming to me sort of paralyzed by doubt and, right. you know, sort of saying, you know, I, I, we've run into this problem, you know, what should we do? Because then what that does is that turns into days and days of meetings and the more people you bring in, the slower it goes and you don't necessarily even get to the better solution the best person to make that decision is the person working on that. Right? Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So what about trading and investing? What makes a great trader and investor? Is it the balance that you mentioned earlier of knowing thyself, but not overanalyzing? So now yeah, overanalysis leads to paralysis? I, yeah, not to like sort of rehash that, but that sort of that, that being in between um, meta-analysis meta -analysis paralysis yeah. and overconfidence and like thinking you figured it out that is the sweet spot yeah. you know you have to figure out your own personality as well mm -hmm. that's actually a great point 
yeah. is you see different personalities, right? right. And particularly pro professionally, and you have to trade and invest based upon your personality. Right. So I've always been the type that can really kind of like handle um, stress. And it might have come from sports, right? Like, you know, like missing the game winning basketball ball shot and then getting over it very quickly yeah that kind of mentality like served me well in mm -hmm. trading but you might be trading right next to a person that does, has that opposite personality where they're the ones like you know always thinking of the risk and what could go wrong and all yeah. which is great too because i'm not great at seeing the risk necessarily in the future right um where somebody else might be better you know, like, oh, what if uh, we go into hyperinflation or whatever? Right, and, right. Well, that never happens. And it's like, well, what if it does? Right. You know, and so that person's important. So they need to figure out their own personality versus mm -hmm. my personality. So my personality would be like, oh, man, I guess that is a, it's a small chance, but I, I, I should be treating that as a black swan. Right. That person needs to figure out their own personality and be like, I'm always worried about the black swan. Right. 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 So they need to like adjust their, you know, sort of paranoia yeah. versus my optimism. Right. Because right. we're both probably slightly wrong. Right. Yeah. And so like adjusting your sort of investing and trading strategy to your own personality is really huge because then you're going to find out what you're good at. Right. hundred so, percent. Yeah. So in options, you know, market making, we see this right on the platform. Like you can, there's certain people that are just, I'm just this type of options trader. I buy stocks and I sell call spreads against my stock and I do it yep. over and over again. Or I love selling iron condors in, yeah. in, you know, in stocks and I just love to collect that income and I react really well because if it's about to go outside, I know to close it. If it stays inside, I'm really good at keeping it like, you know, making the most money out of that income trade, right? Yeah. So, but that's a very specific personality, right? And so, oh, or then there's the people that are like, you know, I just love when, you know, stocks are the stocks I like are down 25%. I love to get in and just do like a leverage play for it to bounce 10%. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's that person's personality. Yeah. And so finding like who you are and what you're good at. And then sort of like, you know, you even see the people like they go back to the stocks that they know. Right. And there's a danger of like seeing patterns where there are no patterns, yeah. but there's a comfort level that allows your decision making to be, you know, if I, if somebody just told me to go trade a stock that I've never heard of and I have no <laughs> sort of history, right. I'm just not going to be confident in it. Yeah. Right? And I'm probably going to make bad decisions. But if somebody's like, oh, trade Apple. And I'm like, oh, I've traded Apple a million times in my life. Like, right. you know, I kind of, you know, comfortable. I, have, I have a good confidence. I have a good comfort level. Yeah. yeah. No, I love that. Actually, in the book, I talk about that too. Find here's a strategy, but the oh, the best traders in the world, top one percent of traders, they develop their own trading strategies and they have right. their own nuances and their own way. Find a way that works for you. Yeah, no, and that. some of that may be um, it may be uh, very subjective and not objective. Like it might be correct that they have the confidence in that, and so they make clear decisions because right. they have a comfort level. And right. it may not be that they actually found the one thing they're really good at. They found the one thing that they believe that they're good at. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's very little difference between the two, right? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Okay, beautiful. So um, final question here is what's the best piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience? So I would say from, um, from an options standpoint, I would keep going back to, there is a fear of the options market and there is a misunderstanding of the options market. And so the misunderstanding of the options market is it is a casino and a lottery and it's a place to get rich quick, right? Yeah. So I would love people to sort of, you know, disavow themselves of that view. And then at the same time, that other fear of the options market, which is they, it is a place where people can go and like lose their house. Right. It is, it's both of those things, but mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be. Right. And so I would say like that lesson, you know, to circle back entirely to the platform is we hope that we've built something that helps people see the options market in that way which is it's, it's neither a casino nor does it necessarily need to be something that you don't understand the risk of. Got it. So, um, well, that was the last question. So now I'm going to 
I guess ask another question, but this is a yeah. different different take here. So I love what you said, CC here. How do people find you, get involved, use optionsai.com? I know you have free tools there. Can you yeah. tell us a little about the website and what people can do and how they get involved and open up accounts and all, how's, how's it work? Yeah, so there's, you know, we are a brokerage platform, right? So there's an, you can apply to the brokerage and you have to like qualify for an account. It's right now we only offer options level three accounts, which means that you have enough experience trading and particularly you've traded some options before that you qualify to be able to trade multi-leg options. And there's okay. a long story that I could go into on the regulatory aspects of that, that are questionable, not questionable. I see why they, the, the industry does it, but it's basically the problem is that most people's ex first experience in options is the very basic low probability trades because that's yeah. the only thing they're allowed to start with. Right. We are there to meet them at that moment and they're ready to graduate to the next level of higher probability trading, right? So you mentioned the free tools, um, you know, and people can go on optionsaia.com and read about, you know, the brokerage and read about the platform and watch some videos and all. And then I also write at learnoptionsai.com. Uh, or dot AI. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I do some educational, I do some weekly previews. Uh, I think I'm, I'm learn options on Twitter. And so people can sort of follow me that way with some of the more educational content. You mentioned the free tools. We offer a couple of free tools at the moment, like an earnings calendar, which shows you the expected move and what that uh, stock did its past few earnings and things like that. We offer something where you can see the expected move, like just type in a symbol and see the expected move over time. Mm -hmm. We are planning on launching, hopefully by the end of the summer, um, a um, subscription version of Options AI, which would essentially allow you to use, you know, all of the uh, parts of Options AI with like building trades, seeing trades, comparing trades, trade scanner, all of these visualizations and things like that. Uh, you know, even if you didn't want to fully commit yet to a brokerage product or you're in Canada and you can't anyway, you know, like those sorts of things. Right, right. So understand. that's coming down, that's coming within the next, we're actually working on it right now. And it's going to be really cool because it's going to basically be, you know, every, we're going to be offering what we feel like is a revolution in this market and a completely different way to see this market. We're going to basically be, you know, it's going to be available to everyone. And then what we we're pretty confident that you know, you're going to see options AI, then look at your existing brokerage platform and be like, uh, yeah, I want that one. I want the new one. I so, love it. So the more people we get in in front of, the better. You know, yeah, this is awesome. Well, I love your mission. I love what you built. And if I could buy calls and options AI, I would. It's uh, fantastic. I wouldn't buy a single leg calls because now they're no, buy a call spread. I'm about to correct you. Exactly. Um, but your Twitter is options with an S learn at options learn, just to be clear. Is that you? Learn options. Yeah, learn options. You want to check? Because I, I, did you? I just want to double check before. I just followed you. Yeah, so it's options learn. That's why I'm asking. I options followed you back. Learn. Yeah, it's at options. I don't even know my own Twitter feed. It's okay. At it's options. Yeah, it's options learn. So at sign and then options with an S and then learn. Yep. Wonderful. Go. Well, Cece, thank you so much for coming on the show and hopefully we'll see you again soon. This is awesome. Excellent. Great to meet Likewise. you. Great to hang out. Likewise.